an attack on Israel that takes place there. So what you see there with the, and then you have also you have uh, Israel, you have uh, Hamas soldiers or Hamas terrorists, whatever you want to call them, guerrilla warfare uh, soldiers that are there, and they have U.S. It looks to be the, like they have U.S. weapons. Well, where would they have got those from? The same ones that were left in Afghanistan on an entire army base with dudes that roll up with uh, Nikes and Suburbans. Yes, and Trump's going to put it down again. So there you have it, right? Uh, Islam is always used as a tool. It's always used as a tool to fight, and to kill Jews and to kill Christians. <clears throat> to kill Jews and to kill Christians. Always. Always has been. To kill Jews and to kill Christians. The Crusaders, they, they were lined up to go over there to fight Islam, and many of them were Protestants, many of them were people that uh, died, right? And then those Crusaders were turned on the Christians, and then some of those people were professing Christians, fighting Islam. Islam is always used as a, as a weapon. Why? Well, because Islam is a daughter of Rome. It is, it, is, it is the same spirit. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. And upon her forehead was the name written mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Who's that? You let people say, well, that's the Jews. That's, no, that's not Israel. Israel didn't, didn't kill hundreds of millions of Christians. There are 100 million Christians. That was Rome that killed 100 million Christians. Right. That's Rome that is all. The papacy did that. That wasn't Jews that did that. And upon her forehead was a name written, right? And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. So he's going to explain who that beast is. We're not going to do that right now in, in, in essence of that, but we're going to make our comparisons here between Rome and uh, the and Mecca or Mecca and the Vatican and uh, <coughs> Rome and Islam. Because Baptists have to deal with that. They've always had to deal with that. They had to deal with that. They, they still do today. Bible believers have had to deal with Rome, Islam. Anytime another enemy is created, it never bodes well for Bible believers. Why? Because if anybody's going to get killed, it's going to be them. They're the hated of all. So you have the Jews and you have the Christians. You have both, right? You have both, and they will be hated of all men, right? So Rome has, their, we, just to review a little bit, Rome has their canon law. Islam has Sharia law. Rome has this canon law. that is None of that's biblical, right? And neither is the Sharia law. Canon law is the body of laws and regulations made by ecclesiastical authority for the government of a Christian organization or church and its members. It is the internal ecclesiastical law governing the Catholic Church, Latin Church and Eastern Catholic Churches, basically all Catholics. The Eastern and e Oriental Orthodox Churches and the Anglican Communion of Churches. They're all Catholic. <laughs> That's what they are. The way that such church law is legislated, interpreted, and at times adjudicated varies widely among these three bodies of churches and all their traditions. So that's, uh, that's uh, canon law. The Pope had his, has his canon law. It's not scripture. So what is your church governed by? This book. 
this book, not, well, we're, what's your church constitution? We don't have one. Well, why? Don't you need one to exist? No. Where in the Bible does it say we're supposed to have a constitution? We have a Bible. We have the Word of God. That's what we're governed by, is the Holy Scriptures. That's, we're not governed by anything. Why do I need some uh, extra biblical articles to, to be governed by? We don't. We just look at the plain Scriptures and say, well, that's what God's Word says. Amen. But they always have to have something else. They always have some man-made authority, something that comes in. Sharia, or Islamic law, deals with many topics addressed by secular law, including crime, politics, economics, as well as personal matters, uh, such as the marriage bed, hygiene, diet, prayer, everyday etiquette, and fasting. Adherence to Islamic law has served as one of the distinguishing characteristics of the Muslim faith historically, and through the centuries, Muslims have devoted much scholarly time and effort on its elaboration. Human interpretations of Sharia vary between Islamic sects and respective schools of jurisprudence. Yet in its strictest and most historical coherent definition, Sharia is considered the infallible law of God. That's what they believe. There are two primary sources of Sharia, the precepts set forth in the Quranic verses and the examples set by the Islamic prophet Muhammad in Sunnah. Where it is official status, Sharia is interpreted by Islamic judges with varying responsibilities for the religious leaders, the imams. For question not directly, questions not directly addressed in the primary sources, the application of Sharia is extended through the consensus of the religious scholars. In other words, a bunch of religious scholars are going to tell you what God really means. In theirs, theirs is, is Allah, which is not Jehovah. Allah is not the God of the Bible. Right, Allah is Baal, that's right. It's false God. It's not the God of the Bible, which is basically Baal is just another name for Satan. It's just another uh, personage of Satan is all it is. Psalms 19 tells us in the scriptures, the law of the Lord in verse number 7. Why don't you turn there and look at these verses, Psalm 19, 7 through 10. Just a reminder here quickly. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. Andrew, I just keep hearing that song. I just keep wanting to sing that. That's not right. You keep hearing that song, right? Singing that. That's a great one, isn't it? Uh, amen. I like those scripture songs. Those are, we got to sing those again, brother. We'll have to add some, some of those in and sing those, especially in the morning when we first get here. Amen. Singing scripture would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Rome and Islam. Next, Rome and Islam both call Jerusalem sacred and want to rule it. You have Rome that wants to rule Jerusalem, right? And you have Sharia, or you have Islam that wants to rule Jerusalem. This, all this battle and fight over this city. Why? Because God put his name there, that's why. And when God puts his name somewhere, Satan wants to fight for it. What did Satan say in Isaiah chapter, is it 5? Or I can't remember which chapter, maybe it's 14, I can't remember. I will ascend, the five eyes that he said, I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. I will set my throne above the the stars of God. Yeah. Right, the sides of the north. What is that? That's the congregation. He talks about the congregation. He wants to rule the church. He wants to set up, he wants to set his throne above the stars of God. That's the angels. He wants to be above all them. And he wants to be like the Most High. Well, that's the same thing Rome does. It's the same thing Islam. They want their name in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem and Islam refers to the status of Jerusalem in the Muslim religious tradition. In Jerusalem, there's a temple that's built on the site of the second place of worship, built by man. After that, Masad al-Haram Makkah, whatever that means, is the third holiest site in Sunni Islam after the mosques of al-Haram and Mecca. And al now, See, they put their holy site right where they believe the Jews believe. Now, I have a theory that I don't believe it is that site. I think, I think that 
you're going to have a negotiator or a peace treaty person come through and they're going to find archaeology that's going to say that it's over here or something, that the real temple is, the temple site is over there. They're going to find conclusive evidence for that and they're probably going to end that battle and they're all going to get along under one big Antichrist banner until Jesus comes back and the Antichrist is going to show up and there's going to be some issues there with that, obviously, until the final battle that takes place. But there is going to be that battle. Now, Jerusalem is strongly associated with, uh, obviously, the biblical prophets, David, Solomon, Elijah, and Jesus. It was the first direction of prayer in Islam before the Kaaba in Mecca. According to the Quran, the Islamic prophet Muhammad was taken by the miraculous steed Barak, not Hussein Obama, <laughs> but Barak, to visit the farthest mosque, which many Muslims believe is the al Aqsa. Aquaza Mosque in Jerusalem, where he prayed and was then taken to heaven in a single night in the year 620. This event is known as the Israel Wall Mirage in Islamic tradition. Israel signs a peace treaty with Jordan, which according to reports in, in uh, the news, uh, included secret clauses concerning water in Jerusalem. The agreement had been negotiated in London eight months before between Rabin, King Hussein, and Lord Victor Mishkan. As part of the agreement, Jordan would receive control over the Islamic holy sites within a Vatican-controlled old city of Jerusalem. So there was a, uh, the, 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 these accords that took place uh, back in the 90s, where they took place to give the rights to, to the Temple Mount to be held by the Pope, the Vatican, to broker a peace treaty. So you say, well, why would Rome want to control Jerusalem? Well, they've always wanted to control Jerusalem. Go back to Constantine. And if you go back to him, what you find out is, is that he, he wanted to control Jerusalem. He wanted all the artifacts. He wanted everything there. Nero comes in before him, and Nero comes in and trashes Jerusalem, right? Titus comes in, excuse me, Titus comes in, and, and uh, he comes in and he decimates Jerusalem. Right? He, he flattens in AD 70, he flattens the temple. He desecrates, he puts the abomination to make it desolate there, and he, and he uh, stabs a pig on the altar, I believe, is what he did. Uh, but uh, anyway, he defiles it, he tears it down. Why? Because they want Jerusalem. They've always wanted Jerusalem. It's, it's, the kings of the earth have always wanted Jerusalem. In March 1995, a cable came from the is, is Israeli uh, embassy, excuse me, the Israeli embassy in Rome to the foreign ministry was in Jerusalem is leaked to radio station Arutz Shiva, confirming that they hand over Jerusalem to the Vatican. Two days later, the cable made front page in the, in the news. In the widely dis distributed minutes of the meeting with President Clinton in 1997, Shimon Perez ended the cable with the words, as I had previously promised the Holy See. So, if you remember right, uh, Shimon Peres was the president of Israel at the time. He was the prime minister or the president of Israel. And he had promised the Holy See, that's the Vatican. He had promised them that he would, he would hand over the rights to the temple and to the mount there. He would hand over those rights of control to the Vatican for peace. So he wouldn't hold them, Islam wouldn't hold them, but the Pope would hold them. Why is that important? Because he wants to build the temple in Jerusalem, right? That's what the Pope wants to do. He wants to build a temple there. He wants to build his temple there, and he wants to say that he is God. He wants to sit in the seat. Where is that? It's in 2 Thessalonians. Turn there. Just remind you. Let's see. I lost my chapter here. Give me a second. Maybe it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Oops, I'm in first. That's why I'm not finding it. Here we go. Paul says it. He says, there's good, he, said, he says this, Let no man deceive you by any means, in verse number 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition 
who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not when, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Now they had to think it was pretty close when Titus came through there in, in AD 70 and tore the place down and, and you know, um, and they took all those Jews back and they took all those Jews to Rome and they made the Jews build the Colosseum that they murdered the Christians in. That's, see how that works? Right. But just remember, just remember though, this goes all, yeah, he enslaved them. That's right. He enslaved them and he made them build, he brought them, why? Because that troublesome city. Go back. You don't believe it? Go back into the Old Testament and look. What did all those kings say? <laughs> they, wrote, they wrote letters, right? And they had them in their records. They're like, that city has always been trouble. Why? Because they always had these tumults and these risings. And the city would, there would always be a war in Jerusalem. Oh, like, like today. Like right now. Yeah, always has been. God said there always would be. Until he comes back and lays it down, right? And then it'll be finished. New Jerusalem will come out of heaven, right? It'll come right down there, boom, and it'll be over. There won't be any more of that. There'll be no more wars. Amen. Nobody will have to die anymore like that. Would that be a blessing? But you know something? He, he opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's what happens. It's going to happen. That's what the Pope wants to do. But he always, something happens to change those plans that it doesn't quite happen yet. Why is that? It's not time yet. That's why. When it's time, they're, all, they're talking about the third temple. You got all these Christians getting excited. Yeah, we want to go build the third. What, what do you have to do with building a third temple? You're not supposed to be building anything except preaching the gospel. So those people get saved. Like, we got to build a third temple. For the Antichrist? What are, you, what are you doing, right? Why do you want to do that? It's weird. Just a weird understanding. Anyway. So, but that's where you see that, right? But they want to set it up. They want to set their dominion, dominionist kingdom up, don't they? It's part of dominionism. That's all that is. It's all, it's all part. Now, a lot of those guys don't believe in dispensational theology of any sort. So they're, they're, some of those are preterists or some of those are uh, partial preterists, which is, you know, I, I get some things that have already taken place, but... Uh, they're, they're looking to set the kingdom up on earth here. That's what some of them are looking for. And the Pope's going to, they're going to play right into the hands of the Antichrist is what they're going to do, right? That's going to happen. That's already happening now with some of them. Roman Islam. Let's go back to, uh, but, but by the way, never forget that Israel belongs to God. Jerusalem belongs to God. The city of the great king. It, that hasn't changed. Oh, God's done with that. He's never, really? I don't think so. I don't think so. He's not done with that. God don't care about that. What? Oh, he cares about America then, right? That's what it is. America and Britain, they're the new, they're the new Jerusalem, the new Israel. That's what God cares about. He don't care. God don't care about that over there no more. Really? What's that? Rome on the Potomac. Yeah. They, they, they don't care about that anymore, huh? God's done with that? I don't think so. He said he's going to bring new Jerusalem down. He said the dimensions of it. He said how he's going to do it. I think you ought to listen. Amen. I think it, I, I think there's a lot of sense there, uh, good biblical sense. Yeah, but I don't understand why is God going to do. You don't have to understand it. You just got to believe what God said. That's all you got to do. You don't got to understand any of it. There's a lot of stuff I know. People ask me, well, what do you think this means in Revelation? Man, I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to get you to live for God today, right now. <laughs> So it's not that I don't care about prophecy. I talk about it sometimes. But man, I want you to live for God now, today. I can't explain to you what some lamppost means. <laughs> like, or what that means. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. Well, what do you think the timing of that's going to have? I have no idea. What are we going to be doing in the millennium? I don't know. Fishing. I don't know. I, where are the kids going to come from? I don't know. Where are all the babies coming from? I do not know. Somebody else has it figured out. I'm worried about what you're going to do today with your babies today. Right now, how you're going to raise your children. I don't know. But some things God's made plain for us to understand. But the timing of some things, he, Jesus said, well, you ain't going to know that yet. It's not for you to know the times and seasons in which the Father has put in place his power, right? 
but she shall receive power. Guess what your power is for? To go witness with the gospel. That's what you're supposed to do. Quit trying. You don't need to build any kingdoms here. You need to preach the word. Amen. Right? We're not here to build kingdoms. We're here to preach the gospel and see men saved. Amen. That's what, that's what we're here to occupy till he comes. That's it. There's like, that's, that's what you receive power for. Not flaming crosses in the sky and swords and go conquer and all. No, you are here to preach the gospel. He said to the apostles very specifically, here's what you're given power for, to witness, not to start a kingdom, not to make a Christian nation. There already is one. It's called God's people. They're a Christian nation. How about that? They, they are. We, we're a holy nation, right? A holy people. But we're not a, we're not a nation like of the earth, like the people. Our, our king's in heaven. We're not, we're not like that. We're a peculiar people, a holy nation, right? That's who we are, but we're not, we're not Israel. We're not trying to be Israel, right? We're the Lord's church. We're trying to see other, people, other churches started, to see people saved all over the world. That's what we're supposed to do. We're gonna be all over the place and all over the world. That's where the gospel is supposed to go. And we're to start churches everywhere. That's what we're to do. That's our work until we die. That's our work until Jesus comes. Amen. That's it, that's our work. People get confused about that. They'll think they need to, you know, get Constantine back in office, right? That's what they're going to work on. So Roman Islam also, let's look at those similarities. Let's keep looking. Roman Islam teaches salvation by works. Say the confession of faith. The Muslim must confess there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the prophet of God. They, the Muslims, they pray. Muslims are supposed to pray five times a day, shortly before sunrise, mid-morning, noon, mid-afternoon, and after sunset. I'm glad I have a Bible that tells me to pray to my God without ceasing. Because I pray all day. No, I'm not, I'm not standing around praying so people can hear me. And this, I'm not doing any of that. I don't, I'm not listening to that. That call of that sick dog that's playing the whole time. And they're all like, I, yeah, I'm not, God never called me to, he said pray without ceasing. And all men don't have to hear me pray either, right? So I'm, I'm, I, I don't have to do it as a show for all men to see me and, and, and we gotta have this call to prayer. And all. No, there, you know that your call to prayer, you already been given it. It says pray without ceasing. So when I'm walking by today, Lord help me. Amen. Paul gets in his truck when he's working. Lord, please help me not to hurt anybody today. <laughs> Lord, please give me patience today. Lord. Lord, don't let me knock my head on this. Right? Where do I face? Anywhere I am. Amen? Right. But that's what they, right? They, they, they have a set time. What's legalism? It's, it's legal. Like God says, pray without ceasing. Same as Rome. Right, the same as Rome. Giving of alms. Muslims are to give about 2.5% of their wealth. I wonder how they figured that number out. <laughs> they fast during Ramadan for one lo lunar month. No, lunar month, I'm sorry. For one lunar month from sunrise to sunset, Muslims are not, not to allow anything to pass down their throat. Theoretically, a good Muslim would even spit out his or her saliva. That's weird. Then, then from sunset to sunrise, they are permitted to eat as little or as much as they want. This is their way of developing discipline and relating to the poor. Travelers, young children, and pregnant or nursing mothers do not need to keep the fast. That's good. Make a pilgr the Next thing they have to do is make a pilgrimage to Mecca. Pilgrimage to Mecca. Every Muslim who is financially able is supposed to travel to the birthplace of Islam once in his or her lifetime. Muslims have no guarantee of being saved, like Catholics. They have no, well, Catholics, they, they're, they're gonna go to purgatory and then somebody, the Pope goes to purgatory. So he's God on earth, but when he dies, he goes to purgatory. Wait, man, you're telling me you're going to a temporary place of burning for a little while? At, at a, wait, you were God on earth and you couldn't say, hey, I'm gonna make sure I'm going to heaven. But you were God on earth here. They have no guarantee of being saved, neither do, Neither do Roman Catholics. They have no guarantee of being saved. You ask a Roman Catholic, what, what do you have to do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Like how, 
Uh, I try to uh, do good things. Uh, my good outweigh my bad. I try to give to the church. I take the mass. I take the, you know, all. Well, but you don't know for sure if you're gonna if you die. No. Muslims have no guarantee of being saved. They believe that all their works will be accounted for, and that on Judgment Day. Oh my. If your bad works outweigh your good works, you're going to go to hell. But if your good works outweigh your bad works, you'll probably go to heaven. Since God is all-powerful, they concede that he may do with you as he pleases, even if you've been very righteous. They hope he won't be having a bad, be, excuse me, they hope he won't be having a bad day at judgment. But that's, that's the God they serve, though. He's not, the God we serve is from the scriptures and he absolutely tells you what you must do to be born again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right? But God tells this very plain, like he doesn't leave it up for you to wonder. Any wondering is from your own mind. God's word is settled on what salvation is. He that believeth on the Son hath life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. God's word is plain. There's no gray area of salvation. Amen. When the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus said it very plainly. Right? When the, when the Philippian jailer asked in trembling, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's, it's very simple. It's not, there's, not, there's, no, there's no question about the gospel's clear. Why? Because I serve a righteous God, and because he is righteous, he lays things out straight and plain for you to understand. God doesn't speak in mystery and confusion. That's what the devil does. That's what mystery Babylon does. That's what Rome does. That's what Islam does. That's not what God does. God is plainly. The, the doubts and fears that you have, they have nothing to do with what eternal life is and what Jesus said, right? God gave his only begotten son to die on the cross for your sins and to be buried and to rise again from the dead. That's very simple. He said in him you might, that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That's a guaranteed promise. God doesn't leave you to question what the gospel is or how you can be saved or how a man is saved. How is a man forgiven? Well, the just shall live by faith. We are justified by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God's word is clear about salvation. Islam is not. You may serve Allah your whole life, and then if you die, then if, if Allah is having a bad day, you're going to hell. Same thing as Roman Catholicism, right? Their works, what they, they committed the... the uh, what were those sins called? I can't remember, the Roman Catholic ones. Uh, cardinal sin, yeah. Really? Yeah, right. Then if you've, if you've committed those sins, right, you're, oh, you're, you're done, really? So the blood of Jesus doesn't cover all sin. Not for them it doesn't. But according to the scriptures it does. So take your salvation from the word of God and not from a man's lips. Not from a man's tainted heart, but take it from the words of God. Amen. Can't tell you that enough. So these, they believe uh, there's a place called Varzak or Purgatory. Not temporary, but relief is possible. This is not a temporary hell. Hell is a fixed, permanent place, but Allah may allow some Muslims to be released from it because of his mercy. So he has a purgatory too. We believe the prophet will be allowed by Allah to intercede, he says, on behalf of some believers who are in hell, and by Allah's will, they will be taken out of hell. So how would you like that? Well, if you're on the good side, then if, uh, if, if Muhammad, right, if Muhammad determines that uh, he'll let that prophet, we believe that the prophet will be allowed by Allah to intercede. Okay, so you don't, but you don't know, there's no no-so salvation. There's no way you can really know. You ever heard Catholics say that to you? There's no, I mean, there's no way you can really know. Really, what are you reading? These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. 
That sounds like no to me. <laughs> that sounds like a no-so salvation. Amen. That's what that is. That's a no-so salvation. It says you can know. Amen. But they have this, they have to, well, maybe I'll all be merciful. Maybe. My Bible doesn't deal in maybes. It deals in absolutes. God doesn't lay, I'm telling you, I'm glad I serve the God of this Bible because he makes things plain to me. Like these words are not confusing. They're very plain. Like there's no way around it. It's very simple. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That sounds like a no-so thing. That sounds like an absolute thing. Yeah, because Jesus died on the cross for my sins and he was buried and he rose again from the dead. He didn't ask you to do anything. He did everything. That's the difference. Colts want something from you. God gave something for you. He gave his only begotten son. Amen. Allah will also take out of hell some believers, not because someone has interceded on their behalf, but simply because he chooses to. So he doesn't have an absolute law. You never know where you stand. We don't serve a God where you never know where you stand. Now, you may have a problem in your own mind. You may have a problem in your own mind. And you may have a lack of faith, and I may have a lack of faith sometimes. And we may be weak sometimes, and we may doubt and question. But that doesn't change what God said. And by the way, your doubts and your fears don't change the absolute truth of the legal transaction of salvation that takes place. Amen! Get that through your head. Your problem is your thinking is wrong. And yes, I'm talking to you. Your thinking is wrong. That's why you have to be renewed daily in your mind in the scriptures. So you don't float around in doubts and fears, but you trust the living God and his words because they shall not fail. I don't serve a God that I have to question or wonder what he's, what he's doing or if he's in a good mood today. Can I go talk to him? I'm to come boldly before the throne. I can talk to him every day, every hour, every minute, every second of the day. Amen. That's right. Because of the immutability of God. It's all because of God. Because of Christ, you're not, if you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not going to go to hell because of Christ, because of God, because of who God is. Do you understand that? You don't get that with Allah. You don't get that with the God of Roman Catholicism. You have to wonder, well, I wonder if I did enough. There's nothing you can do. Your simple question then required quite a complicated answer, says one. In summary, as Muslims, we believe some wicked Muslims will be, this is from their website, we believe that some wicked Muslims will be sent to hell for a limited time, but ultimately will be granted paradise because of the mercy of Allah. What is that mercy based off of? Like, what would it be based off of? And, and it's not absolute for everybody, it's just for some people? Do you see, we serve an immutable God that does not change. And because he does not change, you can always trust what he says. Your feelings change. Your mind changes. Your fears come. You have doubts. You have problems, you have, you have trials. God doesn't have any problems. God has no problems. You, you got it? God, God doesn't have, how am I gonna forgive this sinner? No, God already knew how he's gonna forgive sinners. That's right. Through the atonement of Jesus Christ. That's how all sins are forgiven. And that's how they will always be forgiven. There's never a time when the blood of Jesus cannot cover all sin. 
Amen. Or has not covered all sin. It, it already has. By the way, you want to know why Muslims do what they do? Because work salvation will make a man do anything. When the Pope told the, and then here's what I'm talking about this. Where does that doctrine, why are all these people going, and they, they believe they're going to inherit, like, how many virgins was it? Was it? What's that? 72. 72 virgins, right? If they, if they commit jihad, right? If they kill in the name of Allah or whatever, they're going to get, well, work salvation. I mean, the Pope told the, uh, the crusaders that if they came off the field where they were at, if they did this 30-day crusade against the Albigensians, the, they were Baptists, if they, if they would kill these and wipe out the whole town, then they would be guaranteed heaven and all their sins would be forgiven and they could have any land they stole and everything they stole from those people. And all of their sins would be absolved. Oh. Was well, that why they did all that? Yeah. Jihad is a ticket to paradise. If killing will give forgiveness of sins and Rome had kings killed to receive pardon for sins. There were kings that literally came to the feet of the popes, weeping and in tears, in sackcloth and ashes. And the pope would keep him outside of the Vatican, outside of the walls of the Vatican, sitting there until he would allow him to come in. And that king would beg the pope to forgive his sins. Or if the pope's confessors found out that the king did something wrong, that king would have to go kill people like the Albigenses. Otherwise, they wouldn't be forgiven of their adultery, and they would go to hell. So that king would wipe out all those innocent people. See how nasty work salvation is? Amen. From the most ancient times in the church, good works were also offered to God for the salvation of sinners, particularly the works which human weakness finds hard. Because the sufferings of the martyrs for the faith and for God's law were thought to be very valuable, penitence, penitence used to turn the martyrs to be helped by their merits to obtain a more speedy reconciliation from bishops. Indeed, the prayers and good works of holy people were regarded as of such great value that it could be asserted that the penitent was washed, cleansed, and redeemed with the help of the entire Christian people. Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy Apostolic Constitution of the Revision of Indulgences, chapter 3, 6, page 78, 79. Indulgences, granted indulgences, right? By the way, did you know that Rome uses prayer beads and so does Islam? The subha beads are, often, are most often made of round glass, wood, plastic, amber, and gemstone. The cord is usually cotton, nylon, or silk. There is a wide variety of colors and styles on the market, ranging from cheap mass-produced prayer beads to those that are made with expensive materials and high-quality workmanship. The subha is used by Muslims to help count recitations and concentrate during personal prayers. The worshiper touches one bead at a time while reciting words of the dikr. Uh, remembrance of Allah. The recitations are often of the 99 names of Allah. 99, huh? Or of phrases that glorify and praise Allah. These phrases are most often repeated as follows. The Subhan Allah, glory to Allah, 33 times. What? The Alhamadilla? I don't know. It sounds like Armadilla, but it's not. Praise to be to Allah 33 times. The Allah Akbar, Allah is great 33 times. Yeah. The, this form of recitation stems from an account of the Hadith in which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that's what they say, <laughs> peace be upon him, but uh, instructed his daughter, the Fatima, to remember Allah using these words. He also said that the believers who recite these words after every prayer will have all sins pardoned, even if they may be as large as the foam on the surface of the sea. That's a lot of sins. Muslims may also use prayer beads to count multiple recitations of other phrases while in personal prayer. Some Muslims also carry the beads as a source of comfort, fingering them when stre stressed or anxious. Prayer beads are a common gift item, especially for those returning from a haji, a pilgrimage. Did anybody ever, was anybody a Roman Catholic that had those beads? Did anybody grow up Roman Catholic? Anybody in here? Paul was close. It was like Anglican, but not quite. 
right? <laughs> anybody else have prayer beads? Did anybody have those? Well, you'll find that Hindus have those, or, and, and those from those, they all have those prayer beads, right? They all, why? Well, they're of the same spirit. They, it's paganism. Did you ever see Roman Catholics with those? Well, they're doing their Hail Marys. They were walking around the abortion. Yeah. Remember there remember the Paul, they walk around, they have that, and they're they got the and they're going, and this woman has this abortion sign supporting abortion, like we murder babies all and the and that those those uh Catholics are like Yeah, they're they're like they're like casting out the that de- those Hispanic Catholics, remember it? Oh, they got mad at me. I preach the devil right out of them as soon as they come up, I start preaching it. Man, that's pagan. Right? I just start preaching to them. To them. I was like, you got a worse devil than those people do. Because they got these prayer beads and they're praying. Oh, they're praying. Those kids are those college kids that go to the Catholic college. They're down there and they're, they're holding their beads and they're praying. They're, and they got their little talisman they're walking around with. It's sad. But it's true. And they need the devil preached out of them. They need somebody to tell them, what do you see praying with beads in the Bible? Where is he holding something like that into praying with it and saying you're Hail Marys and you're Our Fathers? But that's Rome, right? And that's Islam. They do the same exact thing. Rome, next, Rome has Christ being the final pope. Islam has the 12th Imam. A majority of Shiite Muslims traditionally believe that the 12th Imam, Islamic religious leader, born in 868 AD, was placed by God into hiding known as occultation. That's interesting. Until the Day of Judgment, Southern Baptist author and evangelist Anis Sharosh explained that many Shiites also refer to the 12th Imam as the Mahdi, an Arabic word that generally refers to Messiah or a guide. This man will come to show them the way because the prayer of every Muslim five times a day ends with, show us the right path, not the path of those who have incurred your anger or those who are lost, but those upon whom grace has come. Though most strains of Islam have a belief in the Mahdi, Shiites traditionally believe he is Muhammad ibn Hassan, the twelfth in the line of Imams who were descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. Though they do not know when the Mahdi will return, they believe he will come to, to end the misery of his people. Some strains of Islam even hold a belief that Jesus will be the Mahdi who will return and proclaim Islam as the true religion. Now, the Bible speaks of another Jesus. It's the Antichrist. And he's going to come. And if, the, if they believe, if, if certain sects of Islam believes that that Mahdi is going to be Jesus that is going to come, won't it be perfect that it'll be an antichrist that rises up, that comes in the name of Christ, but he is not Christ? Kills right, and kills Christians and everything else, and, and or whoever's there, right? He, he murders them, he murders the Jews, kills the Jews as well. He'll turn on the Jews, right? He will turn on them, and they'll wake up. Right? At that time, God says. But, but that's, they believe that, right? They, they believe that that one is coming. They believe, all the world is looking for that man that will come. You know, and who is that man? He's the man of sin. See, we look for Jesus, right? We, we want Jesus to return, right? We want the, the world, their acceptance is going to be of the Antichrist. That's, they, all these, these false religions are gathering together for that last and final prophet that will come. Uh, Alice Bailey, was it called? Didn't Alice Bailey call it the, uh, uh, didn't she believe in the ascended masters? These, they, by the way, if you look at portraits or drawings of these ascended masters, they, they all look like uh, the fake Jesus. Caesar Borgia, they, they all look like him. They look like that fake Jesus. Why? Because they're setting up an image. They're setting up that image. Belief in a savior is universal, BBC News quoted Ahmadinejad and say, as saying in January, this is a long time ago, but it is the pivot of our beliefs as Muslims and Iranians. We believe that an offspring of the prophet, may peace be upon him, will be the ultimate savior. His name and attributes are clear. He will come and will administer ultimate justice. The belief that the Mahdi's return is near is not a new claim among Shiites, Wagner said, but one that has been held almost since the 12th Imam was historically placed into hiding. 
Almost every generation has some figures in Islam that either claim to be the 12th Imam or claim that the 12th Imam will come to himself. Sometime in the future, right? That 12th Imam, it's the Antichrist. That's who's going to come and merge it all. Look what the Pope is doing. He, he talks, he kisses the Quran. Uh, the last Pope John Paul, what does he do? He kisses the Quran. He has a peace treaty uh, with Shimon Perez. So you have Muslims and you have Jews and you have Roman Catholicism and they're all agreeing. That's, that's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for that final prophet to come. And the Bible says he's going to come. It's the Antichrist. And he's going to deceive the world. That's what the beast does. And lastly, the, the identifying factor of Islam and Rome is the murder of Christians. It's the badge of the whore, right? Revelation 17, 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. They wondered why. John saw it and he just couldn't believe it. That what it means is he, he was marvel. He marveled at it. He couldn't believe, like, what is this? It's estimated 50 to 100 million Christians have died from Islam or fr from Rome or from Islam, but mostly from Rome. But the daughters of Rome, which are like Islam and some of the reformers, right? that ran Christian states would put to death. So you have right here, you have these people, you have Muhammad and his followers, when they had absolute control, and anytime those, these groups of people were a part of that, these Baptist people, Islam would turn on them. The Islamic people would turn on them and kill them. They would slaughter them. Rome would kill them and slaughter them. Why? Because they're the same spirit. You find it through history, you see it. There are, there will be times at peace where like the Albigenses and other groups and the Paulicians, the Paulicians especially, because they were in that area, they would think that they would be safe and they would be good citizens and nobody would kill them. Well, Islam, the Islamic leaders would kill them. They would kill them. And of course, Rome would. By the way, what did Rome use to kill them though? They would instigate Islam. Same thing they're doing now, same thing. So there you have it. There's a lot of the similarities there between the two. We'll get back to back on the trail of Baptist of straight Baptist history there. But it was important that we take that time because in between 600 and, and, and 900, you have that rise of Islam through there that really decimated and Baptists would die. Bible believers, Baptists would die. Baptized believers, they would be martyrs and they would be killed by Muslims and they would be killed by Rome. They'd be killed by both of them. And it's still happening today. There are Christians that Islam, uh, those Islamic people, uh, the warriors will be set against. And there's Christians, by the way, in a lot of these countries like Iraq and other countries like that, there were Christians there that were killed by Muslims because of the invasion of America. They were killed by, Christians would be slaughtered. We're always slaughtered. And then so are the Jews. That's just how it works. Defense. Right. And they defended them. They, right. They, they did. And sometimes the Muslims would protect them because they were good citizens. They didn't hurt anybody. That's in history. You can see that. In fact, you see it through this time period, Paul. That's where it was, was through that time period. The Christians would hide out and the Muslims would protect them. Then another leader would rise up who knew not Joseph, right? The same example of that. In, Right? The Calvinists were coming to kill them, and they, so they went to the... They would run. They would run. And it's, it's true. They would. Yeah, it is crazy. Like we said, truth is stranger than fiction, isn't it? Hard to believe, but it happened. And it will happen again. You know, you, you're seeing this. Now you're seeing this, this war rise up, right, with Islam. Now over there, and it's going to get more heated has to right steam rolling down to the end times even so come lord jesus amen, amen. <laughs> that'd be a blessing wouldn't it father in heaven lord we thank you we thank you for your words 
And thank you that we know them, Lord. We're not deceived by Antichrist. We're not deceived by those spirits. But we have the book. And we have the Holy Ghost of God to discern these things. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for salvation by grace through faith. That not of ourselves, not of works, as any man should boast, but the pure sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for my sins and for our sins and for the sins of the whole world, and that he was buried and that you rose again the third day, that we have life through Jesus. Thank you, Father. Save the lost, Lord. Strengthen the saved. Get us home safely, Lord. Give us safety this week. Help us to be useful for your kingdom. Help us to be good witnesses of the manifold grace of God in our lives. Help us to love one another with a pure heart fervently. And bring us back safely together.